that we're about to say was written in partnership with an Indigenous elder who worked with Healing Equity United to recognize the importance of honoring the lands that we're occupying. And so um, we start off this way to express gratitude and appreciation to those territories we are residing on and as a way of honoring the Indigenous people who have been living and working on this land from time immemorial. It's important that we understand the longstanding history that has brought us here and seek to understand our place within that history, whether we came here by choice or were forcefully brought to this country. And so Healing Equity United is on the lands of the Moakma, Ohlone, Piscataway, and unceded Duwamish territory lands. It's critical that we take a moment to recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon Indigenous peoples in the Americas, including their forced removal from ancestral lands and the deliberate and systemic destruction of their communities and culture, which still happens today. Over 100 million Indigenous peoples were slaughtered in the Western Hemisphere over the past 500 years, and today there are only 6.8 million Indigenous folks left in the U.S., so please join us in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and present and to consider how we are and can each in our own way try to move forward to dismantle the continued, of oppres continued oppression of Indigenous communities. We encourage you all to look at the lands that you're on, educate yourselves about those communities, share your learnings with others, and take action to support those local Indigenous communities when you can. We also invite you, and I see a lot of you doing in the doing this in the chat. Um, please honor the lands that you're zooming in from by um, sharing that in the chat. Uh, and if you need support to um, figure out the lands that you're on, um, we'll drop a link in the chat as well. And with that, I will pass it over to my colleague Fiona. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we usually go into a very in-depth diversity statement, but because today's topic is so chock full of information, we wanted to um, narrow down that content and simply say to each of you, thank you for joining us. You are welcome. All of your identities that you bring into this space are welcome, regardless of race, religion, ethnicity, color, skin tone, um, ability, education, class, regardless of any of those factors and many, many more, we welcome you and your multitude of identities. Thank you for joining us for this very important conversation regarding identity. So we also want to take a moment to say that this month is Hispanic Heritage Month, um, and each year we observe this month from the 15th of September to the 15th of October by celebrating the histories, cultures, and contributions of American citizens whose ancestors came from Mexico, the Caribbean, Spain, as well as Central and South America. The reason for these dates is because it coincides with several Latin American National Independence Day. So the September 15th is really for Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. The 16th yesterday was for Mexico. Tomorrow, the 18th is for Chile. And then the 21st is for Belize. As we know, um, as some of you might have this in your cities, people are celebrating through festivals, parades, art shows, conferences, community gatherings, and so much more. And so we encourage you this month to find ways to be allies as well as co-conspirators to the Latine, Latinx, Hispanic community and to continue learning more about their culture and their people. Um, we're gonna go ahead and drop some links into the chat for you all. Some of you may know that um, they have been trying to get a museum built um, on the National Mall in Washington, DC um, to be called um, the Museum of the American Latino. And that's really one way that um, you all could support um, by learning more about that project and the importance of having that museum um, in our nation's capital. And since um, I'm already talking, I guess I will go ahead and introduce myself. Um, and thank you to those of you who are introducing yourselves. I'd love to see who's here. So my name is Jess and I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I identify as someone who is a first generation immigrant. I was born in the British colony of Hong Kong, came to the US when I was about four years old. Um, and um, my parents were working class. We grew I grew up in New York City, took ESL classes. And as soon as I learned enough English, I became the de facto interpreter, translator for my parents. 
uh, which is something that I still uh, do to this day. Currently, I reside in Oakland, California with my partner, who is second generation, grew up in a wealthier socioeconomic class. So we have a lot of conversations about classism and immigration. We have two doggies. Um, the Hanson who is pictured above is my service dog um, because I also live with an invisible disability. And so with that, I will pass it over. Hi everyone. My name is Fiona Oliphant. I am a first generation Jamaican American. Um, folks in my family range from being completely undocumented to naturalized citizens. Um, so always had to be aware of the multitude of challenges that immigrants, particularly those without documentation, face. Having said that, I'm a U.S. citizen, and there's a lot of power and privilege in that identity, and I'm always challenged to leverage that identity to be in better solidarity with immigrant communities. I'm an attorney barred in New York and D.C., um, and even though I don't currently practice law, I always have to be mindful of the duality of that identity. For some people, um, it automatically grants me credibility and value. But on the other hand, it can be alienating um, and, and put a wedge between myself and community members. I'm from the South Bronx in New York City, um, a community that's primarily Black and Brown, has higher rates of crime, poverty, and substance use, and higher rates of love, support, and resilience to make me who I am today. And last but not least for these purposes, I am married to a cisgender white male who is an immigrant from Europe. We talk about the fact that his immigration journey has significantly differed from everyone else's in my family, um, his whiteness and maleness. Talk about those issues as well. We have three biracial children, half black, half white, the eldest of whom identifies as a black woman with a white father. Cassie? Thank you, Fiona. Hi, everyone. My name is Cassie. I'll also share some of the identity markers that I come into the space with. Um, I am a cisgender, queer, second generation Chinese American. I also identify as mixed race or biracial as I have a white father. I was born in the state of New Jersey, but when I think about home, I think of the city of Philadelphia. I'm a first gen um, college, first gen grad student. Um, I have my master's in education and started my career out as a middle school science teacher. And so I wear that educator hat in all the spaces that I occupy. I currently though live in Seattle, Washington. I've been out here for almost eight years now. I live with um, my partner and Dago, who are pictured here. My partner is a cisgender Black man who's working in housing and homelessness in the city of Seattle. And I'm going to pass it to Jess to introduce a little bit about HEU for anyone who might be new to our team. Yes, so we're really excited to see you all here. Some of you may already have been, and I do see some familiar names um, from our past uh, webinars and workshops. So thank you for being here. So um, Fiona and I started Healing Equity United about five years ago after having been executive directors and board members and realizing that there were very few people, even over the course of our career, very few people in leadership who um, represented the communities that they were actually serving. And so we came together, essentially what Healing Equity United does is um, we support organizations in transformative culture change to really focus on um, serving their communities. Um, and to us, that's really about going back to uh, their mission um, and doing so through a diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging lens. And I'm gonna share some of the group agreements that we would like to um, ground our time together on this topic. So there's no room for the oppression Olympics in this space, by that we mean that we all have a number of identities that we're bringing into this space. And we're not gonna compare each other's pain or targeted um, hate that we receive, right? Because we work from a space of all of our liberation is tied because all of our oppression is tied. Hopefully this will be a brave space. We can't guarantee safety in this space. So what we can do is identify harm when it occurs, interrupt it, mitigate it. That means whatever you're sharing in the chat, please feel free to share it, but be mindful of the impact on others. Hopefully there'll be challenging conversations, especially 
around this topic. Um, and when you start to feel that, like, mm, I don't know how I feel about that, lean into it because that's what you're here for, challenging moments, right? That push your um, evolution and growth in terms of DEIB. We're gonna respect each other's lived experiences and perspectives in this space. We invite you to say it messy in the chat. What we mean by that, you don't have to have 100% grammar, use capital letters, make sure the punctuation is great. Get your ideas out there because we want you all to engage with us and each other. However, be mindful of the impact of what you're sharing. okay? Be okay with non-closure. It's taken us hundreds of years to get to this space. We're not gonna solve it right now, okay? Um, if anything that is vulnerable or sensitive is shared in the chat, please keep that information private. So what's said here stays here, what's learned here leaves here. And finally, take care of yourself. Thank you, Fiona. Some webinar technical agreements we'd like to share with you all. Um, if questions come up for you, please feel free to put them into the Q&A section. We're going to have some time, hopefully at the end, to do some Q&A. Um, Feel free to continue to use the chat. We have loved seeing everybody um, communicate uh, some of the identity markers that are important to them, the work that they do, and just saying hi. So please continue to do that. Um, as a reminder, I know Jess uh, put this in the chat earlier, the recording and slides will be sent out to everyone who registered. So if you're seeing um, that maybe a colleague or friend who had registered isn't here, no worries, they'll be able to see this um, recording. And uh, last but not least, if you have a reactions button at the bottom of your screen, please feel free um, to use it to share what you're thinking or feeling. Um, we've loved seeing that so far. Um, as we were sharing our uh, intros. So thank you all. Please continue to do that. All right. So our topic for today, there's a lot to cover in terms of identity politics, um, the history and, and the current context of identity politics. And so we're going to under, understand, hopefully, what we mean when we say identity politics, explore how identity politics shapes perspectives on political issues, candidates, and parties through the lens of group association and perceived um, oppressions, uh, examine common critiques of identity politics, analyze how identity politics plays a role in modern elections with a focus um, on double standards for some candidates, and explore how identities intersect and affect political and so, uh, societal dynamics. I also want to take the mom a moment now to just give a caveat that I, myself, Jess, Fiona, we are not experts in this topic by any means. Um, this was something that, this is a topic that uh, sparked interest for the HEU team. Um, and for me in particular, given my mixed race identity, as we've been seeing a lot, I'm sure many of y'all have, of comments, questions, racist remarks, et cetera, about um, candidate Harris's identity. And so um, we're going to try to cover a lot today, but we're not experts. We can't answer all the questions. Um, so just keep that in mind. So for an opening activity, um, we'd love to get some interactions in the chat coming through. And we just want to know, um, you know, briefly, what brings you here today? What are you hoping to get out of the session? What made you register for this webinar on identity politics? And feel free to enter that into the chat. Um, as they start coming through, I'll read some aloud for accessibility purposes. What brings you here today to this webinar? What are you hoping to get out of this session? Go ahead and put your thoughts in the chat. I know earlier I saw someone mention that uh, they do trainings on intersectionality and identity, and so they're hoping to learn some more information. What else? What brings you here today? Mm, someone coming in from British Columbia with an election coming up in October. I wanted to gain insight on subject matter. The election will bring up a lot of issues, and I would like to learn more about the dynamics of identity politics. 
looking to gain language to describe what I feel and to talk about it with people who um, who feel it isn't a big deal or that there are that these issues aren't related to politics. I hear so many negative things about identity politics, so I thought I would learn more. Want to learn more, have more insight. I'm looking to learn more about identity politics, especially for BIPOC folks, and to pass along this learning to my team members. My social work service um, is hoping to lead our own discussion on the bi and multiracial identity seems pertinent now. Such a timely topic. I need more language to advocate safe space to discuss identity politics and racial identity. I love what I'm seeing. I want to learn more about the topic to be aware and share with the people around me. Awesome. Thank you so much um, for sharing. Those of you who have so far, please continue to um, share those thoughts in the chat. We're so excited to um, hopefully touch on a lot of what has been shared in the chat so far. So let's dive in. I think it's important for us to um, sort of define identity politics uh, before we dive into the topic. And um, through some of the research that I did, um, identity politics came up as a tendency for people of a particular re religion, ethnic group, social background, usually a marginalized identity to form exclusive political alliances, moving away from traditional broad-based party politics. Um, it generally refers to people evaluating issues through the lens of their association with a specific group. And this in turn means that approaches to issues, politicians, and political parties revolve around how those things affect the relevant group or groups. Um, it arguably arises from our natural inclination as humans to desire, um, you know, connection and acceptance and a sense of belonging, right? And I think it's important to note that um, this concept of identity politics isn't a left or right thing. It is used by all political groups along the spectrum. Again, it's not just left or right. It's used by all groups along the political spectrum. But the phrase is rarely defined by those in favor or critics of it. Instead, the phrase, especially um, as I'm sure y'all have seen today, tends to operate as a catch-all buzzword for whatever features one likes or dislikes about contemporary and historic social movements that focus on the liberation of particular oppressed groups. Um, and I'm sure as we know, right, identity politics can also create some backlashes among those who disagree with what it means for the rest of society. And so let's dive into um, a little bit about the history of identity politics. So what we've come to call identity politics was initially developed in the feminist, gay liberation, and anti-racism social movements of the 1960s and 70s. Um, these groups who were organizing were organizing along identity and sought to break down the particular types of oppression that these groups experienced. And these movements operated on three core themes. One, the structures of oppression produce shared experiences and identities among the oppressed. Right? The shared identities and experiences of an oppressed group can be used as a basis for building a social movement aimed at the liberation of, that, of those said social groups. So for example, feminist social movements, the commonality, the experience that they have of uh, sexism under the patriarchy. Right. The second um, kind of core theme to these movements, positive group identity helps folks to unlearn the negative self-conceptions in an oppressive culture. Right. So part of um, coming together within um, uh, the black culture was to combat that internalized um, those internalized messages and stereotypes about anti-blackness. Right. And then the third um, theme among these groups is that the liberation of the oppressed group must be achieved by the oppressed group themselves not to deny people outside of these oppressed groups from joining the movement, but that there is a need to follow the lead of those who are closest to the issue, right? 
And I want to hone in on a particular group that um, came out during this time and and really helped to kind of continue to form this idea of, of identity politics. <clears throat> and this is the Kambahi River Collective. Um, and this was a collective of Black feminists who came together in the 1970s, and they published um, the Kambahi River Collective Statement in 1974. And the center of this um, statement was this idea of addressing a whole range of oppressions, not just one oppression. They named that the major systems of oppression are interlocking and that our oppressions are tied and therefore our liberations are tied as well, right? Something that HEU talks about a lot. Um, this statement took into account the intersectionality that people experience um, as opposed to just honing in on a racial identity or a gender identity, right? Those intersectionalities create unique experiences of oppression. Um, and they talked about in this statement that uh, the quote here reads, if black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would, would have to be free since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all systems of oppression, right? Our oppressions are tied, therefore liberations are tied. Again, coming back to our um, group agreement around uh, not buying into the oppression Olympics. Now, this was the history, you know, kind of the start of identity politics, but it has transformed a lot um, over the past decades. And it's brought us to this very unique context that we have in the 2024 election um, that brings us to just some really dicey moments. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen or heard about this particular interview. Um, and I think that this clip is a prime example of how identity politics are attempted to be brought into this 2024 election and potentially weaponized. And so I'm going to play the clip in case folks haven't, haven't seen this. Give me a moment here. Sir, do you believe that Vice President Kamala Harris is only on the ticket because she is a black woman? Well, I can say no. I think it's maybe a little bit different. So uh, I've known her a long time indirectly, not directly very much. And she was always of Indian heritage. And she was only promoting Indian heritage. I didn't know she was black until a number of years ago when she happened to turn black. And now she wants to be known as black. So I don't know, is she Indian or is she black? She is always but identified you know as a black woman. I respect she went to a historically black college. I respect either one, but she obviously doesn't. Because she was Indian all the way, and then all of a sudden she made a turn and she went, she became a black person. Just to be clear, sir. Do oh my God, this clip. <laughs> yes. It is wild that this is the place that we are at in 2024, right? Again, I think this video is a great example of the way in which former President Trump is trying to play into identity politics for the election and playing into the erasure of mixed and biracial people's full identities, right? In this clip, it's very clear that he's saying she can only be one. Is she Black or is she South Asian? She cannot be both, right? And so let's dive into this a little bit more. So... As I was researching for this webinar, I came across this really um, wonderful article um, and this quote um, from Thambisa Mshaka, and it reads, identity politics is a phrase used pejoratively when discussing politicians who aren't straight white men, who practice identity politics just as boldly with full knowledge of the xenophobia, transphobia, racism, and misogyny their policies reflect. Identity politics are only a problem when the face of politics is non-white, female, Muslim, or LGBTQ+. Right? Now, again, I want to repeat, the concept of identity politics isn't a left or right thing. It's used by all political groups along the spectrum. But when white politicians play into identity politics, right, it is often riddled with you know, racist comments, sexism, trying to weaponize, right, identity. Um, but when non-white, female, or other historically marginalized identities um, talk about their identity or play into, you know, identity politics, it's seen as playing the race card or playing the woman card, right? And we saw this in, um, and we'll talk about this in a moment, 
we can see this in um, strategies of Hillary Clinton back in 2016 and comparing the strategies of Kamala Harris in this election. But I got, I got a name. So the context that we're in today is very unique, right? We have 27% of the members of US Congress identifying as women. 119 women serve in the House and 24 women serve in the Senate. Of the 143 women serving in this 117th US Congress, 34% of them are women of color, which is amazing. Now, arguably, Hillary Clinton helped to pave the way for this con for the context for this election and for this um, you know, context to be what it is, right? It is now more normalized to see a woman up for a position of leadership. The face of power has changed. And yet there is still a double standard. Even with this progress, women running for elective office still face hurdles not felt by their male counterparts, right? For example, men who are in politics get to throw on the same blue shirt, the same kind of suit, while women have to wonder, is this dress too feminine? Is this suit trying too hard? Can I wear pink, right? And women are judged on the words that they say and how they say them, while men are seen as strong if they attack their opponents. Um, but women, if they're attacking their uh, opponents, can be seen as whiny or rude or bitchy, right? If they're doing the same. And female candidates and their teams have to think about each and every move and decision throughout the campaign through a very different lens than men do, right? And we see a very different strategy happening between what we saw Hillary Clinton using in 2016 and the election strategy of Kamala Harris in 2024. During the 2016 election, Hillary utilized her identity as a woman outright at times, right? We see this quote here, um, I'm sure many of you might remember this, if fighting for women's health care and paid family leave and equal pay is playing the woman card, then deal me in, right? That was a very common clip that we saw a bunch during the 2016 election. And even it became a huge fundraising moment for Hillary, right? Um, the official Hillary, you know, woman card came into play and she was able to raise, I think it was like 2.4 million for her campaign at the time. Harris, on the other, other hand, and we have to name, right, it's very different for, for Harris in terms of her identity as a woman of color, um, has attempted to center her values and her credentials in her campaign strategy, similar to what we saw Barack Obama do in his 20, uh, I'm sorry, 2008 campaign, right? Her campaign focuses on the policies rather than her identity as a Black and South Asian woman, right, so to avoid being seen as playing the race card, right? And to connect with a broader audience. While she has acknowledged her heritage, right? It's not like she's avoiding it. Um, her strategy mirrors past candidates who, who strive to prioritize their values and credentials over identity. Um, and I'm sure many of you on the call know, right? This is not the first time that Harris has been the first woman or the first woman of color in, in a particular position. Um, but if she harps on that identity as a woman of color, this opens the door for people calling her out for being a DEI hire, right? This article came out uh, in the New York Post a, a couple of weeks ago. America may soon be subjected to the country's first DEI president, Kamala Harris. In incredibly problematic, right? And so... Within, you know, her strategy, there is, you know, um, this need to stop, you know, centering her identity and letting her talk about the work, the plans, right? We even saw that in uh, the presidential debate between Trump and Harris. Um, and, you know, in terms of other politicians, we have seen so many of, of um, politicians of color in particular and of other, you know, marginalized identities having to do to set aside their identity in order to try to just focus on the work that they're trying to do, right? Former Illinois Senator Carol Mosley um, Braun, who ran in 2004 as the Democratic um, pres presidential primary and was the first Black woman to serve in the Senate, said, quite frankly, talking about 
being the first this, being the first that gets you nowhere. It really puts you in a corner and leaves you open to being accused of playing the race card. And so Harris not doing that has been, in her opinion, a very smart move, right? In the 2020 race uh, in, in Maryland, Governor Wes Moore and uh, Lieutenant Governor, uh, Governor Aruna Miller also did not talk about how they would be the first Black and South Asian statewide leaders of Maryland. And Miller said, look, anybody that was in the room looking at us could tell we were a unique ticket. There was no need to talk about it. It was more about our stories. And so, again, Harris isn't avoiding her identity per se, um, even if she's not making it the centerpiece of her campaign. Um in some ways, and and I, as I was doing the research, I I saw this as a move to kind of code switch in a sense, right? She will talk about her identity with the right groups. Um, There's a few weeks ago, um, she was at Howard University, HBCU, her all, alma mater, um, where she was talking about, you know, you might be running for president of the United States one day, right? She is doing her best to center the plans and the work that she wants to do instead of um, letting kind of the nonsense that comes up around identity drown out her messages. And I'm sure many of us were reading all of the articles and things, you know, after the, the debate between Trump and Harris, Trump definitely tried to bring her identity up again um, during that debate, right? And Trump doesn't have to face the same scrutiny as a white man. We know this, right? Folks are the, on the right are trying hard to frame um, Harris as this DEI hire um, and to put focus on her identities um, and to demean her, right? And 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 to talk about, you know, uh, again, kind of this idea of like, you need to choose one, right? You cannot be biracial, right? She, she became Black, right? She also, you know, he also... Um, institutes some other forms of, you know, uh, sexism related to identity politics in terms of, um, I think at this point uh, in the debate, and we can see it here, Trump said, I don't care what she is. All I can say is I read <laughs> where she was not Black that she put out, and I'll say that, and then I read that she was Black and that's okay, right? Again, an attempt to not only attack um, and bring into the conversation her racial identity, but also um, her gender identity, right? Playing and invoking the racist and sexist stereotypes, trying to stoke that in, in the right, right? Now, again, I think it's important for us to, and I repeated this like twice already, Identity politics are not just something that are it's used by left and right. It's all across the spectrum. And there are lots of criticisms of identity politics, right? Even thinking back to that quote that I read earlier, um, when it's used by white, white identified folks, white men in particular, it's, you know, it can be riddled with sexism, racism, et cetera. Um, but when identity politics come to play and are being used by people of color or other marginalized identities, um, it becomes a problem, right? You're going to be seen as the race card, playing the race card. Now, some other criticisms, and I had to bring this in to the conversation uh, just to, you know, bring in some different perspectives. Some other criticisms of identity politics tend to center um, not so much on the idea that people's group identity should be important in their politics, but on ways in which identity politics has been positioned by its advocates. This includes criticism of the rigid norms of verbal behavior that are supposed to be used in reference to identity groups and criticism of the assumptions that people not in particular identity groups are responsible for those, for the negative situations of those who are. Now, when I read that in, in an article as I was doing my research, I immediately thought to fragility, right? Thinking about white identity and potentially white identified folks that were thinking about the context of race who make the argument of, well, enslavement happened, happened a while ago. And so I can't possibly be, you know, responsible for reparations, right? So we got to take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> Additionally, um, you know, I think in my research, some of the criticisms about identity politics came up around equating identity politics with critical race theory. 
And I'm sure everybody on the call knows there's been a lot of attacks on critical race theory over the past year or two years, right? Um, and in particular, you know, its introduction into schools, um, into school curriculum and, and elsewhere, right? And so in my research, I found another perspective. And it's not to say that it's necessarily um, a critique, but it's a different perspective on, on identity politics. Now, I want to give a preface to this perspective that came out in this book from um, Yasha Munk. Now, uh, this book came out in 2023 called The Identity Trap. And um, Yasha is a white German-American political scientist and author, associate professor of the practice of international affairs at Johns Hopkins University. And I should note that on his website, he names that he, you know, kind of touts himself to be an expert on the crisis of liberal democracy and the rise of populism. I should also name um, that I found in my research that, um, you know, he used to be a writer for The Atlantic um, and was let go after allegations of rape, which he said were categorically untrue. So I should give all of this with a caveat, grain of salt, take, taking everything with a grain of salt. But I think he, in this book, provided an interesting perspective on identity politics. He named, and I'll read this quote aloud for accessibility purposes, I think the important thing is not to build a culture in which we are focused to double down on narrow identities in which we cease to build the broader identities like ones as Americans, but allow us to sustain solidarity with people who are very different from us. So his, um, I didn't read the book. I read excerpts and saw some interviews with him, but his, his whole premise in this book is if we're focusing too much on our specific identity markers, particularly those, you know, that might be of um, historically oppressed or marginalized identities, we might forget and, and leave out the opportunities to build connection with others and to bridge a divide, which in some sense I can see as true, right? If we're going too far either direction. And in, in my research and, and digging into his theory is a little bit more, you know, he had mentioned, you know, it's important for us to take into account those intersectionalities, right? And coming back around to why the HEU team was so interested in this topic to begin with, right? The whole concept around Kamala Harris's identity, around any, you know, mixed race or biracial person's identity, this idea of needing to fit into boxes and to choose one or the other. And as long as there has been a United States of America, there have been mixed race Americans. Um, and I think it's important in this conversation to pull in the concept of intersectionality, um, that by looking through an intersectional lens, we become more aware of how different communities are battling various interconnected issues all at once. And to not play into the, you know, one or the other, you need to choose, right? Um, for many mixed race folks, myself included, you know, it can be, our identities can be very fluid and it's important to allow folks for folks to be able to choose how they're identifying, right? This is the predicament that so many mixed race folks face all of the time, right? The whole issue of how humans do or do not identify themselves with various group characteristics and how this impacts their politics is highly complex. And there's a lot of research out there on identity politics and those, you know, kind of impacts in terms of the mixed race identity. And as we've probably been able to glean from the previous slides, right, politicians who are multiracial face expectations that are difficult, right? And in some ways are, are simply unrealistic. I'm sure there might be some mixed race folks on the call here who are familiar with this concept that multiracial and mixed race folks will bring about a post-racial world, right? As we're moving towards a mixed race majority, we might be able to bridge the gap because of these mixed race folks. 
which is a lot of weight to put on the shoulders of mixed race identity, right? Um, and this this group cannot be that destiny, right? Um, and so it's important to to be mindful of that. Um, and you know, even just thinking about, I love this picture here of Obama and and Harris. This was um, when Obama had uh, officially endorsed. Harris, um, although for both of them, they publicly prioritize one identity or the, over the other, they do so while declaring love and respect for their varied familial and cultural roots. And we saw um, in Harris's deeply personal and public use of the term chitis, which in Tamil um, is the term for aunts. This is how mixed race individuals navigate and push back on the expectations of ethnic and racial belonging, loyalty, and authenticity that come in the form of questions, right? For example, whether, you know, Kamala Harris in particular is really Black or South Asian, right? Um, and so I think in, in this conversation and in, as we're thinking about identity, identity politics in this current context, um, it's important uh, to allow for folks to choose who they are and how they identify. Um, and I, you know, part of the part of our um, goals with these webinars is to think about how we can take these topics, these concepts, into our day to days. And so, I think it's really important, you know, if we are thinking about the fact that we are in a very divided, divisive era, right? Um, we're trying to build some bridges. We're trying to bring folks into the fold to cancel out the nonsense and noise of the DEI hires, the you know racist, sexist comments, um, and try to bring it back to you know humanity, right? Um, and so while we are having these, you know, potentially having conversations around politics with colleagues, family, friends, et cetera, um, we need to hold space for that intersectionality. We need to hold space and come back to the tenant that the Kambahi River Collective um, kind of forged, right? All of our oppressions are tied and therefore our liberations are tied. You and I are in this fight together, right? Um, to take into account, again, the, the, that intersectionality, not just focusing on one identity in particular. Um, and I think it's important for us as we're thinking about, you know, trying to move forward to creating a, a, um, cultures of belonging within our workplaces, within our communities, wherever we might be taking up space, that um, the curb effect um, concept, right? When we think about how, um, you know, uh, lowering curbs so that folks who are in wheelchairs and might be differently abled were able to access sidewalks, that also helps other people too. Folks with strollers, folks who are, um, you know, temporarily uh, on crutches, et cetera, right? Um, it is important for us to focus on, you know, uh, the fact that as we're moving forward in social justice, DEIB, whatever you want to call your culture change work, um, that it is going to positively impact everyone, right? It's not a zero sum game. Um, I have been doing a lot of talking and I think in, in terms of this slide, I'm curious, Fiona or Jess, if there's anything else you want to add to this. Yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing all of that information. The only other thing that I would add, well, there are many things, but there, there's one thing that I would add for this group. Because I heard in the beginning in the chat that people wanted to have more information in order to push back, to navigate what's happening and be able to hold space and have these conversations. The one thing I would add is this. The decision to force all of us who have a multitude of identities into one box is a byproduct of systemic oppression. It is intentional. And every time we say, I am not one thing, 
right? I am not just black. I am not just a woman. I am not just middle-aged. I am not just differently abled, right? But every time we do that, we are forcing a system to accommodate the entirety of us, right? And I think that we have to be able to empower our colleagues, empower our staff, empower folks in the community to be able to fight back with that language. No, you're not gonna make, uh, uh, uh. I'm not gonna have to make her force, uh, not gonna force her to choose to be one thing or another. She is both and many more and so am I, right? So we wanna be able to empower people to, to fight back with this. Thank you so much, Fiona. Jess, anything you wanted to add? Um, no, let's go, let's go into questions. Just I'm wanting to make sure that, you know, we, we have time um, to ask what you all are thinking. And so like, what's coming up for you all? What questions do you have? Uh, we want to provide the rest of the, the time and space for you all. And as we're waiting for questions to come in, I, I did want to ask Fiona if you can share a little bit more about like, you know, how has your family given their multiple identities, right? And having like uh, being multiracial, how have they been navigating some of this? Because they are black and, right? So like, how has this been affecting um, the conversations that you all have been having? Yeah, thanks for the question. As I said earlier, my eldest identifies as a black woman with a white father. Um, she recognizes biologically that she is half black and half white. It's a funny story though. My kids did one of those genealogy things and it turned out that in terms of ancestry, they're a bit more Caucasian than I had anticipated. And I'm like, oh my God, wait, they messed up their... And my kids were like, mommy, Daddy is entirely white, and I hate to break it to you, being from Jamaica, you have some European ancestry as well, right? So even in doing that, um, I have to acknowledge that we, we have a, a variety of identities, and so we've had interesting conversations. My two younger ones call themselves sometimes Black, sometimes biracial. Um, and it also depends on context. In New York, in the Bronx, when we're there, they let everybody assume that they're Dominican because of their skin tone. <laughs> they understand Spanish and they can respond. Like they're not gonna get into an entire conversation about the identities that they bring into the space. But I think one context that we've always provided is that you get to determine how you identify yourself but you have to recognize how others perceive you and may treat you accordingly. So we always um, left room for them to bring varied identities into the space. I see we have a question. Yes, I'll read it out for accessibility purposes. I'm thinking about how we collect data and how we force participants to select various identities. Often this data leads to information as to why things need to change. Do you believe the same framing of identity politics crosses into data collection to defend targeted change. And I, I'll start because as soon as this question came in, I was like, oh, it's the US Census, right? And then the American Community Survey, right? It's like you're forced to check a box. Um, and one of the things that happened in the 2020 Census is that um, in Puerto Rico in particular, there were um, Puerto Ricans who were checking the white box. And so, having people check a box. So they were checking the white box or they were checking multiracial, right? But that multiracial box wasn't broken down for them. And so having people check a box, I, I think that, you know, it, it does um, cross into data collection um, and it, go, it goes both ways, right? In the, in the way that, that it's framed. Um, Fiona, what do you think? And then Cassie, what do you think? I think that you're right. And I think that, um... There is a new trend, a new study, and I think I'm going to be um, looking for the link 
that I can put it in the chat for you. But there's a new study not only to allow people to identify themselves racially and ethnically, but also to have a street identity. Um, and the argument is, if you went to a hospital, right, um, and you didn't look quote unquote black, or you didn't look quote unquote Asian, what's your street identity and how would the hospital perceive you and treat you accordingly? Right. And so there's a lot of research coming out about this. There's a push to add this in some way to the upcoming census um, because we are recognizing that those boxes are not sufficient. They're really not. But I'll look for that information and put it in the chat. Thanks, Fiona. Yeah, I think just to echo what uh, Jess and Fiona have shared, um, if you are in a position at your organization to be creating evaluations or surveys, I think it's so, as someone who's multiracial, I think it's so important to be able to allow for multiple checked boxes um, or to write in um, what you identify as. Um, I saw someone added into the Q&A. Um, someone just mentioned the data factor. I remember the last census survey refused to choose from only one of five boxes and instead chose the other box, which choosing the other is also if, at, at some for some folks who are mixed race or biracial feels like defeat. Like you are just putting me into this box of I can't categorize you. Right. Um, yeah, there was one other thing, but I can't remember at this point. What other questions are coming up for y'all? I will say that I spoke to someone higher up um, in, in, in the federal government um, a couple of months ago about this U.S. Census having a check a box issue. Um, and what I was told is, because what I propose and what we do at Healing Equity United is that we allow people to identify how they want, right? So it's more like, what, what do you want to if we ask you for your race, how do you identify, right? And it's just a blank box. And what this person told me is that it's not that it's impossible to do, but so much of our federal policies and our grants that go to nonprofits are based off of a lot of the boxes that are checked, right? And so if there were no boxes, it would make things really difficult for them to actually be inclusive of certain communities. And so um, it's not that they're against it, um, but it, they did see that there was a little bit of a of a barrier um, in, in implementation. Um, I wanted to uh, highlight also a comment that came up in the chat. I work in the area of HR compliance, and while the EEOC, um, and that's EEOC is Equal uh, Employment Opportunity Commission for those who may not know, racial groups are far outdated. They will be adding a Middle Eastern North African option soon for workplace da data collection. And um, these individuals, I argue for committee making changes to disaggregate Asian, but that did not happen. Yes, absolutely. There ha has to be disaggregation um, for, for the Asian community. Um, I think the Middle East or North African ad is a good thing. It's been um, something, but the reality is that people in that community have been fighting for that for decades. It shouldn't take decades, right, to add something like that. They should, there shouldn't be a fight. And yet, at the same time, we know that there is. I think one thing that um, I will add to Fiona's, um, Fiona just found that link to drop in into the chat. And just thinking about the concept of street race, I think in terms of any, you know, identity that you might hold it's important to acknowledge that we hold the right to share as little or as much with people, right? So for example, you know, <laughs> um, I, I named earlier, I'm, I identify as queer. And more often than not, if I am in a very, what I'm perceiving as a very straight space, I will just say queer and leave it at that. And um, if I don't feel comfortable with the person who might, might ask, you know, further, deeper, like I don't need to share that with them. Right. And so again, coming back to some of that, almost like code switching, like I'm, I'm going to share more deeply about my identity with folks that I'm feeling comfortable and, and brave and safe with, as opposed to, you know, some other spaces that, you know, I, you have that right to not have to share that. What else is coming up, Jess, in the Q&A or chat? 
um, that uh, someone is uh, lifting up that harm has been caused by a lack of identities in our surveys. We've done better and realized it's essential to create space for healing and listening when these harms occur. Yeah. One thing that I wanted to um, just raise, because um, I don't know if, if you went into it in, in substantive detail, but for us as people of the global majority to support each other and maybe course correct for each other when we are the folks who are requiring that other folks of the global majority fit into this box or that box. Um, and we can't promote uh, identity politics in a way that limits us and our expansiveness. And so, you know, that's another, another component uh, that I would encourage y'all to use with your staff, with your colleagues, with community members. So, you know, we can't, we can't police our own as well, right? Like we can't try to um, limit all of who we are. Did anything else come up, Jess? I think we are a little low on time. So I want to transition us now into um, a thank you for taking the time to be with us, to be in community with us today. Um, we'd love to connect with you all on LinkedIn. You can um, connect with us there, follow the page to stay up to date with uh, the HU team. And um, we love to get feedback so that we can continue to improve uh, our webinars. Please feel free to take two minutes out of your day to provide some feedback for us. I just dropped that link um, for survey in the chat, or you can use the QR code that you see on the screen here to answer, um, I think it's four or five questions. And so um, from the HEU team, thank you everyone for being on the call. We hope to see you at the next uh, webinar next month. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.